Well, welcome everybody to the heart and uh, an evening of rambling with Cami. And I, you all probably know Cami better than I do. I've only been here a short while, but the little bit that I've known of Cami and what I really, really experienced to you was at the Writers Festival when she um, rambled on about her stories of traveling and. It moved me so much that I really wanted to make sure that we honored her here at the heart mm -hmm. with a, a, a full evening of just Cami and nothing else. <laughs> well, maybe a little bit of wine, but the rest of the evening is about you. Um, I'm not going to ramble on because she's got some great stories to tell. And um, yeah, take it away, Cami. Well, it's going to be one. One long ramble. But I'm starting off with showing you all the things that I could collect at home that actually came from Kathmandu. This month. The last time I was in Kathmandu was, two, can you all hear me? Yeah. 2012, when I went for the 13 International Indigenous Grandmothers Conference, and a Nepalese Kaman Shaman was the person of honor at the time and I had not been there for many years and it was shocking. So much pollution and this is a pollution mask. Wow. <laughs> uh, and I never wore it there, came back with a cough because I walked everywhere and thought that I probably had TB because actually TB was quite right there but I didn't. I just had masses of Duck. <laughs> anyway, I have to talk quickly because we don't have a long time. This is a necklace that was, they don't make them anymore, was given to children when they first cut their teeth to keep away the evil eye. And I got it when I was first there in 66. <laughs> and it cost me all of a dollar. And there was a guy selling two, and I loved them both, but I only had the equivalent of a dollar because you didn't need much more. A cup of tea was like one cent, and you know, I didn't know I was gonna run into this lovely guy in a little alleyway selling these beautiful things. So I hope it keeps the evil eye away from me. <laughs> and I've got my Ganesha, who dispels all obstacles. So if there's going to be obstacles while I talk, um, <laughs> I'm hoping Ganesha's going to work for me. One of my very old earrings, I lose most of them. I've lost the other one. Um, traditional Nepalese style. This is a Tibetan earring found at that very exclusive shop on Bowen called the Nick Nat <laughs> <laughs> um, And I'm going to go back. You didn't think I'd take you back to when I was a baby, but just for a second I'm going to take you back. When I was born, I was born in the war. <laughs> That's nothing to do with it, but my mother got sent out and I was born in Oxford instead of London, which didn't make me a real Londoner. Um, <laughs> A doctor or a man touched my head and said, oh, this baby's got a double crown. She's going to travel a lot, or she's going to be a traveler. And my mother told me that, but I don't think she put the idea into my head because from a very early age, I really, really wanted to travel. And I did from age 14 and went to Paris, but not alone. That was with parents. But then from 17, I did start going to Paris and places like that. And I just knew that I was not going to end up living in England. It felt too, too small. But now I'm going to take you to 1966 because I don't know I, if most of you had pivotal things that have happened in your lives that change your life forever. I mean, often it's things like marriage, or, but mine is travel. And, I've always said to people, I do not fall in love with people, I fall in love with places. And, um, and, and as people fall in love with people, it isn't always the most convenient, or there's many things around it. And I guess I've always considered that my true home was Nepal. 
But uh, unfortunately, I wasn't allowed to stay there. So the 60s is also a very special time. And I'm probably the oldest one in this room right now. <laughs> I don't know. I can't judge anymore. Um, but the 60s was a big change time. And it was the year of the fire horse, which Chinese people try not to have their children in the year of the fire horse because it's a very chaotic year. But for me, it actually was a very auspicious year, to use that word, that is used in the East quite a lot. And um, I had been living in Rome, um, having the most passionate love affair of my life. And the lovely guy, Alessandro, Sandro, uh, for briefly, somebody else lured him away. <laughs> And I was so devastated. It was Easter time, and I went back to England, to London, where I came from, and ran into a friend on the street. I still have masses of friends in London. And um, he said, oh, you must come and see these slides. We're, we're doing an overland trip to Kathmandu, and we did it last year. And just come. I think it's the sort of thing you'd like. And so I went to this funny little apartment in Holland Park, I think it was for those of you who know London, and looked at these pictures, and of course it was going through 16 countries, and the pictures of Kathmandu itself just did it to me. And I remember one in particular, and it was a Tibetan, because there were many, many Tibetans who came out of Tibet with the Dalai Lama. Uh, in 1959, or, and before even, because it, that there were quite established Tibetans living in Kathmandu. And there was this Tibetan man with very long hair in pigtails. We called them pigtails. What you, they're braids here, that's right. I, sometimes I go into English, um, <laughs> use the different words, with a big red ribbon on the top and a beautiful coral and Oh gosh, what's the other one that they put? Turquoise. turquoise. Coral and turquoise earring. And this big cape coat that they wore over one shoulder that had big fluffy, you know, sheepskin, sheep fur in it. And it was just so beautiful. And I thought, yes, I want to go there. <laughs> I mean, I can't believe that that was the day. It probably wasn't the deciding point, but I've never forgotten that photograph. So uh, I actually made a Tibetan earring like that, and I lost it recently here. I made it in the 60s. And anyway, I've got to talk much quicker because I want to take you to sort of arriving. Um, the journey took three and a half months because the bus broke down in many places, <laughs> and we had adventures in Afghanistan. But I'm not going to be able to fit too much of a story into it. I just want to, I see it like a film now, you know. It's, but I remember coming up the Raj Park from India, that's this winding road. It had only been built sometime in the 50s, I think. Before that, everything was carried in, or you had to walk in for weeks. Um, it was a very winding, road and you'd look down and you'd see buses and cars and things. And I thought, oh, we'd been in India for several weeks before we went up the Raj path. And I had a, my first Buddhist book. <laughs> I was reading it by Christmas Humphreys, who, who wrote about Buddhism in the, well, I don't know, early 30s on. And I kept thinking, if this bus goes over the thing. I want to be reading this. And then had a window seat. And anyway, and as you arrive into Kathmandu, there's a place called Thangot. And forever in my mind, I've always thought of it as thank God. Because we finally arrived and we weren't dead. And we hadn't, you know, the bus had broken down three times once in Afghanistan where we had a big adventure. That's for another day. Well, this is for the book. Part of the reason I want to do this um, talk is that I'm, I've been playing around with a memoir for so long and I have 
the real problem in writing it down, of course you're not going to get all the details, but if I live long enough and I get this book out, you will get the details. But when, when we first arrived, it was fall of 66, and it had only been open to foreigners since 51, but not much had changed. It, there were all these old palaces, and amazing. So um, my boyfriend was one of the drivers of the bus, and we had to find somewhere where we could park the bus. It was a, an, a, a what do you call them? Well, it was a coach. In England, they were called coaches. They were called coaches. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, um, so we scouted around, and we found a palace. I mean, they're, they're, they're not like palaces in Europe, although they were all built along uh, European styles, but then had masses of rooms. And nobody lived in it because it, it had been um, the old rulers, the Ranas, in between. I'm not going to give you too much history. If you're interested, you can find it out. Uh, anyway, there were all these incredible houses that you could live in. It's, that you, the people had been living, sorry, but nobody was living in it. And we found a guy who was taking care of it. They have these people called Chokidars who take care of buildings and things, and same in India, Chokidars. And um, we asked him, I I is it possible to stay there? And he said yes, because obviously he wanted a little bit of money. And it was huge. But I, I only remember one room, well, we stayed in a room, uh, and one enormous room, and it reminded me of um, Miss Havisham in Great Expectations, mm -hmm. because it actually still had a glorious chandelier, beautiful big chandeliers, and, and I think there may have been a big table, or I may be not remembering that too correctly, but the bathroom was huge and it was marble and there were rats so it wasn't really comfortable and I think we just stayed there until we could find somewhere else and in those days there were only three big hotels and they were expensive, I mean expensive by our standards by, oh they still were expensive by everybody's standards and the only other things were little tiny kind of funky little tea shop things where there may be a few rooms upstairs and uh, all living in people's homes so we eventually uh, had rooms in people's homes and uh, the first place we stayed in or the main place was um, called Rose Cottage and it was down a lane called Piglet. Oh by the way I meant to ask who's been to Kathmandu because because it would mean a lot more if you've been there. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Yeah, well, it changed. It took a while, but it changed rapidly when it started changing. Um, this row of Marupiti led to one of the rivers, and it turned into Pig Lane. It was full of pigs, and it's where they made the first pies. It became famous for making pies, but I don't think I'd ever want to eat a pie in Pig Lane because it was filthy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but the house itself was reasonably comfortable and I don't know. See, I have to explain one thing. People think I'm an old hippie. I was never a hippie. <laughs> but people laugh when I say that, but I was not. And, but I knew everybody from, you know, later on when I lived there, I had the best job of my life. I have to remember the time because I'm going too slow to get... Like, I was there basically for five years. I, I left twice, once to go and have my second wedding in Japan. I married a Japanese man. My first one was a Hindu one and, and in, in Kathmandu. There's a picture of me and over there. Um, and then when I was pregnant, and when I was going to have a baby, I decided I didn't want to have her in Kathmandu, so I went back to England for a while. Um, but I felt just like Alice in Wonderland. It was just so amazing. And in those days, you know, everybody wore their Nepalese costume. You couldn't get any um, Western clothes at all, except 
I did get a job in this funny little boutique run by a lovely Nepalese woman called Bimala who'd lived in Paris and she did make, she had mini dresses, well nobody knew what mini dresses were, so, you know, people, the foreigners who came there. And, and I worked in this shop and she hated working the shop so she'd leave me there alone and there would always be masses of men standing there just looking at me in this dress. And she, for those who saw the article that I had in the in the um, undercurrent, I'm wearing a kind of funky looking suit with bell bottoms. Bimla made that uh, because you couldn't get anything. Oh, I was going to say, this is now a modern thing from Nepal, which I also got on Bowen Island <laughs> at a church sale. And you couldn't get anything like this. You just got scratchy, horrible sweaters that the Tibetans mostly made. And so I, I'm going to have to go quickly. You know, like five years was like 10 or 15 years for here. I think, I really do think things have kind of speeded up because so much happened in that time. We were there for four months and the person, I don't know, why I brought up the hippie thing was, I don't know if any of you know um, this guy, um, I'm not going to get his name, he became famous, he's a singer, um, Bhagavan Das. Does anybody know who Bhagavan Das? I knew you would know. Anyway, he was in the room next door. I will tell you privately about that. He's <laughs> not a very nice character, I have to say. But the first time, he's very tall, and he wore hair like the sadhus, all top knot, and you know, all, we didn't call them dreadlocks then, um, but everybody calls those dreadlocks now. You just said matted hair. <laughs> anyway, um, the first time I actually, he's very, very tall. The first time I saw him, um, it was in one of the tea shops, and he was ordering peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I thought, what the hell is a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Because I had not had any American influence in my life at all at that point. There's no such thing as England, it's jam. <laughs> jelly is jam. <laughs> And anyway, I got to know him quite a bit. I, I, I've lost so many of my pictures. I went to a party that he put on, on Christmas Day, or was it Christmas Eve, which was hilarious, talking about hippies. By then I'd already met some really interesting people who worked in embassies and things, and we had a bottle of scotch, my boyfriend and I, we went with a bottle of scotch and we went late. <laughs> and everybody was sitting around, they were so stoned, lying around, and so there was no music, and so this one guy said, oh, I could go and get my tape recorder, and so he disappeared, but he didn't come back for ages because he got lost, <laughs> you know, and then he came back and he had Bob Dylan, and I can remember, and, but nobody wanted our whiskey. I mean, they'd been so, you know, they'd been smoking so much. And in those days, people didn't, they either did one or the other. <laughs> These days, it's changed, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, that was kind of interesting, living next to him. And, and then, uh, I'm trying to think. I actually had to work because I owed my boyfriend money for the trip. It was all of a hundred pounds, London to Kathmandu through 16 countries. hundred pounds was a lot of money then, and I didn't have it. <laughs> and um, we were allowed four months, I think. We, we did it all. We got, you know, our... They weren't used to foreigners at all, so we got a three-month visa, and then you were allowed another month. And the way they could find out whether you could stay or not was whether you could live in one of the big hotels. If you couldn't say that you had the money to live in a big hotel, then you would... They, oh, it was, it was pre-hippies that hippies came a year or two later. Um, so it, it, 
Uh, there was an article in the New York Times, I remember, about beatniks going to Christmas for Kathmandu. And it's, they didn't know what to make of these foreigners who kept coming in, who, you know, didn't stay in big hotels and didn't have any money. And there had been trekkers coming in and anthropologists and all sorts of people. And nobody kind of was well dressed. But how they could tell was this if you weren't staying in a big hotel and then they would only give you another month on your visa. So I remember that we had to leave in February of 71 and I really, really was in love with the place by then and, you know, but had to go to Bangkok and I had to work. And that was not the easiest of things because I thought I could teach English but the war in Vietnam was on and um, nobody wanted English English. They only wanted American people to teach English. It was, it really was an eye-opener to me. I thought I was really streetwise from London and some devastating things that had happened in my life which is not part of this talk. But I knew a lot about, you know, street life in London. I was just so shocked by Bangkok. I mean, mothers were training their daughters to be prostitutes at age 12. And when I was out on the street alone, um, the, uh, the soldiers they would come from Vietnam for R&R, &R, and they would all shout out at me, we haven't seen a round eyes in six months, come with us. And, oh, it was, it was just very difficult. So. I had all these different jobs. Oh, I had a radio program. I was a, it was called a disc jockey. I just had to pick. Um, it was it was basically for the Americans there because of quite a few Americans lived there, and so it was a record program and it was run by these two, two, two Aus No, it was only run by the one Australian, but he was a gay guy, and he, he really didn't like me because I had to record, I had to make up, um, what do you call them, <laughs> commercials, you know, advertisements uh, for this thing, for Kratin Tom beer, and then I had to pick all these, these, the music that they would be playing. Well, again, I was, this was before English and American music, got all bundled up together. You know, I was still into the, my Beatles and Rolling Stones and things, but no, mm. he didn't like that. I was only allowed to play a Beatles song. I didn't play it, the technicians did it, but we recorded it, it was all pre-recorded. And the other weird thing about working in Bangkok for this particular thing was the guy who ran that program, he didn't like my clothes. And he made me go out and have things made. <laughs> but nobody sees you on radio. <laughs> it, was, it was just because he didn't like me. I, so it was a very uncomfortable period. And all I was doing the whole time, I had, there were a few foreign friends I had who lived there, you know, one worked for an embassy and, and a mother. There, there were all these different aides, you know. Got, you know, like we have now, and uh, helping whatever they were doing. A lot of, lot of um, Swiss aid, now I come to think of it. And um, I was continually writing letters until one day I found out that there was this guy who had this funky hotel in Kathmandu and was building one up in the mountains. And um, it was a glorious place called Pokhara. And I had been there, and I had a friend there who worked with the Tibetans, and he'd introduced me to Tibetans, and I drank with them, and you know, I had a wonderful time. So this was like my dream. And I remember sitting in this awful office. Oh, I worked for the Americans in the end who were doing things uh, in, in, um, in Vietnam. Oh, gosh. In a, in a huge typing pool with I don't know how many men, and I had a desk at the wall, and I just had pictures of Nepal mm -hmm. there, and I was writing, and and I finally found out that this guy was looking for somebody to run his hotel in the mountains. Well, that was in the poker, and that was like the biggest dream job I could possibly have. 
So I wrote back all these letters, and I don't know how, I wish I had copies of them because I was just on and on about how wonderful it was, and oh, I'll, almost like I'll do anything. Well, I don't think I said I'll do anything, but he, he called me back very quickly. I, I had to give up the job. I couldn't decently give my notice in, so I did a few things where they would just get rid of me. Because <laughs> actually, there is a bigger story to this. You see, I, I don't have time to go into details, but I was third national working for the Americans. First came the Americans who worked there, then came the Thais. They were all girlfriends of the guys working there anyway. They were just like, you know, pretty often. <laughs> And then there were the foreigners, and we were a whole bunch of foreigners, and we got paid badly. And the Thai women all could have an hour to go for lunch because they had to get their hair done and fixed and all sorts of things. And, and we had, I don't know, half an hour. And so, and, and we had to dread it. In Thailand, you could wear short skirts because the Thai women did, but not, the, not in the office, not the foreigners. We would, you know third nationals, you had to look kind of different. So I just did all the things that I wasn't supposed to do and they decided that I was I shouldn't be working there. So I was trying to go back to to Kathmandu. But oh he got me back early because he said I've got VIPs coming in. I'm gonna need, you know, a Western person to help out. And the VIPs happened to be Irving Penn, who's a photographer here. I mean, I hope some of you know who Irving Penn is, very famous photographer. His wife, who was one of the first top models, Lisa von Sengrieb, and his assistant, and they were going around the world um, making, with their studio, and photographing people for a book called, it's something like It's a Small World, that's the wrong title, that's too Disney, but it's not, it might have just been called Small World. And so I was to be in charge of them and to bring them up to Pokhara. And so, I, and I arrived back just like a day or so before they came. To, oh, no, I had a big adventure in between. I flew <laughs> Pakistani Airlines, who told me there would be an overnight stay in um, Dhaka. It was East Pakistan, it's now Bangladesh. Uh, and then there would be a flight the next day and they put you up in the best hotel, and that's nice. Get there, and there isn't a flight for another week. <laughs> and I had, by then, I had no money. And uh, I'm in this hotel, and not knowing what to do and where to go, and I'm sitting at the pool. And as you probably know, in these big hotels, you get chefs that come from other parts. They gone to these beautiful international chef schools and they get sent out to work in these, you know, four or five star hotels. And there was a, a Swiss chef and he came out and started talking to me and I told him my story and he said, I may be able to help. And he said, but you won't be able to go out and, and, until I can tell you. He said, we have staff quarters and I could get you a room. You could, I could find out how to get your room because the staff don't care, it, you know, I mean, it's the people, well, I mean, the main staff would, but the underlings or whatever there, and he, 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 and, and he fed me and he could, he told me when I should go out and how to do it and everything, and then I got back to Kathmandu, but I, by that time I had fallen apart from leaving Bangkok, my boyfriend, and losing a lot of luggage because I didn't a lot of things in those days and my luggage was pretty bad. <laughs> you could take much more than you can now, but you know, I think I just had zipper bags and things and, and so I, I lost a lot of my slides, which I still think about for my first time in, in Nepal. And um, anyway, the thing, when I got back, and we fl flew in these little tiny, DC, they were DC-9s with Irving Penn and, and his studio and blah, blah, blah. We had to all be weighed with the things to see if we were, you know, not fit. Okay. And I'm, I can see it like a movie. We get out and there is this guy, uh, he's, 
I'm forgetting his name. Oh my goodness, the guy running the hotel, how can I forget? I failed to tell you that he was, mar he was an Anglo-Indian man, very large man, married to, um, to a Canadian, uh, what, what do you call them? <laughs> it, not a bit evangelist, a missionary, missionary, married to a missionary. And I'd already stayed in his hotel in, in Kathmandu, so I'd met her and she was lovely. But uh, anyway, uh, so I get there and he comes down to the plane. I mean, it's a little airfield. They used to make a big noise to get rid of the buffalo when you flew in. <laughs> he came down to the airfield with this huge golf umbrella, multicolored golf umbrella, <laughs> and, you know, greeted everybody. And then we walked up to his little hotel. It was just above the, the airfield. And I guess... They, the VIPs were taken to their rooms. There were only six rooms or something like that. And then he took me to a room and said, This is our room. Oh, no. <laughs> and then the, the penny drop, you know, I'd been sending these letters. Oh. And he could see that I was some naive. Well, I wasn't that naive. But anyway, from the letters, it looked like I could, could would maybe. <laughs> And it was quite outrageous. But he, the, the wonderful thing is, oh, he, <laughs> he, he had two boxes of Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey under the bed. He was a bit of an alcoholic. And he, as soon as I made it very clear that nothing was going to happen, I think he just helped, you know, drank. And, and he always go to bed quite early. So I would just creep in late and get up early. So nothing, thankfully nothing happened, but I knew that this was not boding well. And, and I remember I couldn't eat and, and there were all the people, the kitchen staff, I didn't speak much in Nepali. I mean, I picked up a few words probably, but at that point, very little, no, and no, none of the people who worked in the hotel um, spoke English, and he was the only one. And so they were all very worried about me because I was quite thin and I wasn't eating. They kept trying to give me food. Oh, and I missed a big piece out. The reason I was so overjoyed to go back to to Pogo was there was a a man that I had a huge crush on. I'd met him when I'd gone up there before when I left my boyfriend down and. <laughs> and he was Peruvian, British and Peruvian, and he worked with the Tibetans, and he galloped around on these horses, these Tibetan ponies, and had long, flowing black hair. And I get back, and the first thing I find out is that he's getting married. <laughs> and I was so miserable, so miserable. Well, not, not just over him, but over the whole situation. And... So about a week, I was there about a week, and and so um, I still can't get his name. I mean, it's written down in my memoir, the bit of the memoir I've written. Oh, Tom Mendes, Tom Mendes. Tom Mendes was having a big party, and he was inviting airline uh, for for the VIPs, and he was inviting airline um, pilots to this party. Oh, at the open. The other thing about Pokhara, when I was there the first time, there was no electricity, and it was, I thought it was so romantic. I was dreaming of myself being there just by candlelight. Now, when we have power outages, I'm really pissed off, but you know, <laughs> it was kind of fun. We certainly change as we age. Mm. Well, some of us do, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, he was planning this big party for the VIPs and uh, the airline guys and and so that night came and I remember it was outside because there were no big rooms and, and the weather was gorgeous of course and it's beautiful and there's a big mountain in the background and but there was a string of bulbs I mean the way they fixed the lights outside I don't know how they did it and the VIPs 
didn't turn up. <laughs> Irving Penn, his wife. Oh, and it was the editor of Vogue magazine was with them as well. As, but the lovely Swedish, um, his assistant came. And the only other people staying in the hotel were two gay guys. And, and then my, the guy that I had the crush on, and, a, well, he wasn't staying there, but he was invited to the party, and he came with a Peace Corps young man, and it was all men. And so Tom gets out the Scotch whiskey. That's <laughs> what you have at this party. And um, very little food. I think it was just like snacks. And they were all drinking like crazy, and I'm sitting there, you know, the only female. <laughs> and he turns to the guys and says to them, she won't sleep with me. <laughs> like they could sympathize with him. And, and then I, I, and everybody was getting drunk. And then I started drinking because I got <laughs> And then I knew that I didn't want to stay there. So uh, this other guy, uh, and I do know his name, but I don't want to say it somewhere. Well, I changed his name in the, in the book because unfortunately he committed suicide later on and I wanted to disguise him, I'd call him Paul. And the Peace Corps said, well, we're, we're staying at the Tibetan Hotel up the road. I'd stayed at it the first time I was there. And the, they have all this space, it's like a storeroom where they keep sleeping bags and things and their dogs sleep. And he's, they said, well, come back and we'll make you up a bed. And so they did and we all went back there. And the next morning when I went to see Tom, <laughs> he's sitting there waiting for me. And then he accuses me of sleeping with all the other guys. Oh, my God. I mean, how silly can, can things get? And then he says, well, you're no longer wanted. He said, I'll give you your... I had not much money. I didn't get paid for being there. He said, but I'll give you your fare back to Kathmandu, you know. So he did. Uh, oh, no, I went off trekking with the, the Peace Corps guy. said, if you want, and it will be good for you, do you want to trek for a while? And I went for a few days of the trek, and, and he was very kind, and, you know, we had food and stuff, and I guess he paid for the food and things, and you sleep in people's homes, and... That was kind of okay, and then I got my went back to Kathmandu, and all my friends in Kathmandu said, "Well, you've got to go and tell Mrs. Mendes what happened." And I thought, "Oh my God, I was so scared." And then I I went back to see Mrs. Mendes, and it was this lovely, it was lovely Nepalese. The hotel was round a courtyard, typically Nepali and Indian, and I'm I'm in her office telling her, and then she said, was there any alcohol? Oh. Said, oh, yes. She was not concerned about the fact, she probably knew he was looking for somebody, but the alcohol really got to her, she didn't like that at all. And I'm telling her this story, and it's probably I'd be back a week before I had the guts, or even longer, to go and see her. And there's a little cor corridor leading into the... Um, circles at the courtyard. Courtyard. Yeah. yeah, I had the word before. And there is this big lolloping, he was a very large guy, Tom coming in <laughs> just as I finished with his wife. <laughs> and so she said to me, I will put you up full board and lodging until you find a job. Oh she asked me what I was going to do and I said I have to find a job. And she said, I will put you up. And then she saw Tom, and I saw Tom, and she said, come back and see me tomorrow. And uh, so we passed each other. And then was the start of my really living in Kathmandu. It took me a while to find a job, but all sorts of wonderful things happened in between, and people always invited me for dinner, and I was taken care of. Well, no, I moved into the hotel. And I finally... It was a, you know what Shivaratri is, it's a big, big festival in February, uh, which I was looking forward to going to, and it's, it's totally crazy. By then, you know, people 
who were kind of hippish, were they, I think they may, may have been called hippies by then, <laughs> would all go and they would sm smoke with the, the sadhus because that's how they celebrate with cannabis. And um, I went and it was great. Oh, uh, oh no, no, I'm <laughs> that's, I missed that. I have searched for weeks to find a job. Then I got the best job that I've ever had in my life to be the secretary for the representative of the British Council. The British Council, it's not the consul, it does educational things and art things and, and uh, they sent, were sending people to England to be educated. And so he was supposed to employ a Nepalese secretary, but women didn't do secretarial work then, it was only men, and I guess when I went, and I did, actually did do Pittman's shorthand and typed, <laughs> not very well, but, but I think he preferred to have an English secretary, and I got the job, and in between there was this holiday, and I went to Pashupatinath, which is the biggest, one of the biggest Hindu places in the whole of that area, even in India, people, sadhus and people coming from all over India, it's quite wild. And uh, I went and I was having a good time. And then I saw these sadhus that called me over and they were sitting in this kind of raised little house thing and um, invited me to sit with them. And then there was a French film crew who saw me sitting there and came with their cameras and wanted to film it because, of, you know, that's how crazy things were. Because you didn't see that many Westerners and so... And then I got scared. I thought, oh God, I've got this job with this very, you know, kind of traditional Englishman that I'm going to be his secretary if he sees or finds out that I've been kind of sitting around with these shadows, he probably wouldn't really want me. But anyway, I got this job and, and therein, I keep looking at my watch because I know I can't go too far. I just really wanted to give you a flavor of how it was. And, and I hate the fact that it's all me, 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 I, I, I. But um, it was the beginning of the, of Really, it was actually the beginning of tourism. There was a man, he was a Russian man, and I'm going to forget his name for the moment, because um, he's become famous, books have been written about him. But he actually started tourism, and he had been a ballet dancer in the Moscow Ballet, if it was called the Royal Ballet, I'm not sure. Anyway, very, very known. Oh, and he had this beautiful, this was a beautiful palace, but also, I'm sure it had rats and things, all the palaces did, um, called the Royal Hotel, and, and it was very famous, and it became the place that you had to go to, because actually, even if you didn't stay there, there was a wonderful bar there, and you could go there. But, um, so tourism was trickling in at that point, but then, I had this job, and I guess I basically only worked for a year, and it was it, amazing things happened. I had a very wonderful friend who had, she was Indian, partly Indian and partly Filipina, and she had worked for the um, British Council in Madras. It was called Madras then, I've forgotten what it's called now. Um, uh, and, and we became very, very close, and we also lived in an old palace again. Well, that's what you did. And uh, we became very close, and she was running away from her husband. But through her, somehow, I, I became totally kind of immersed in, 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 you know, another life. It was almost like I could say goodbye to my English life and start anew there. And I really, really, really did love being there. But things don't last, unfortunately. And then I, I met my Japanese husband, who always seemed to be running around in this enormous car that when it had come to Kathmandu, it had been carried up. People had a, liked to collect these really old, beautiful cars. 
and every time he saw me, he would stop, and so we start, started seeing each other. I'm, I'm, I'm going very quickly, and I hope I'm not boring anybody. No. <laughs> because so I, was, I wasn't even sure how I was going to do this. There's so many really beautiful images, Kathy, yeah. of you. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's so beautiful and rich, so keep going. Yeah. And uh, so I got, and my former husband um, had been invited to open the first Japanese restaurant in Kathmandu by one of the royal princes. And um, he lived in yet another palace where we ended up getting married. Um, it was called Tiger Palace, Bad Durba. Tiger Palace. And so it all happened very quickly because things did happen rather quickly there at times. Uh, he also was very in with the royal family, but not all of them. This is an odd story because I found out things much later, even on the last trip to Kathmandu in 2012, that the people were jealous of him. And any foreigner who was doing really well had a bit of a tough time. And so we did get married, and I don't know why, I gave up my job straight away, but pretty soon I think I found out that I'd made a mistake, because even the day after we got married, I couldn't go to his restaurant. He said, you were girlfriend, now you were wife. <laughs> and I could only go if somebody took me there. It, was, it got very, it was, anyway. <laughs> and then, then I had another leaving of Kathmandu we, we, because we thought we should have some sort of something like a honeymoon. Oh, actually, we did have a honeymoon in Pokhara, <laughs> but that was short. And then we went to Japan where I had to have another wedding. Oh my, oh, it's this wonderful cat that I hear so much. Um, so I, I, I had two weddings. One was Hindu with a, a Brahmin priest, and I had to do all the things with the red sari. And but they cut the rituals down quite a bit because we were both foreigners. And then I had to have another one in Japan with kimono, full makeup, wig. Wow. And I was by then I was three and a half months pregnant. <laughs> it, that was that was a bit of a horror story. Three and three and a half months, uh, three months in in Japan, and that's when I decided that I would go back to England to have my daughter because, as much as I um, love Kathmandu, I didn't think it was the best place to, to go to. I'd be to the hospital when my friend that I just mentioned had a baby. She was pregnant with her lover's baby and she'd left her, husband, uh, her first husband in Madras with the two elder children and she had two young children with. Anyway, I'm, I'm going all over the place so you could lose me here. And uh, I decided to go back to England for a while. And it was interesting because I uh, there was a few months I was back. When I came back, the real hippie thing had started, mm -hmm. and there were hordes of them, and, and it was it was it was not good. It was not good. <laughs> That's all I can say. And that, since I'm not going into details, I mean, sometimes you know they were. I mean, I I hate that title. I hate that word because there were all sorts of poets and, all, and, and artists and things, and everybody got, if you didn't have money, you were all considered a hippie. It was just that easy. And um, I'm trying to think of a nice way to end it. <laughs> um, where do we go from here? Well, it, there, there were so many things going on, you know, um, there was a the guy. There was a guy called Michael Hollingshead, who actually turned Timothy Leary onto LSD, and I met him at a a, a British Embassy garden party, <laughs> which must have been the nearest thing to what the British Raj was like, mm. because it was for the Prince William of Gloucester, who who's the Queen's cousin, or is it nephew? 
who was there for the wedding, the wed no, it wasn't the wedding, it was the was it the wedding or the card? No, the wedding. Yeah, the wedding of um, of the <coughs> prince who then became the king. <laughs> and it was a big deal, uh, it was a very big deal. And so Michael Hollings had knew all these uh, of these poets and he put out this magazine called Flow, I wish I had I taken. And I'd just go into a house and show that picture and people would just make a fuss. Wow. No, I've got lots of stories, but I don't know if I, you've got the best ones. I just thought I, <laughs> I didn't, you know, when I very kindly got invited, I thought, well, how am I gonna do this? Because, you know, I, I have had lots of travels, and lots of adventures, you know and lived in Rome and, and Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I thought, well, this is what I'm writing about. And why I asked to have it filmed was because I thought, oh, maybe I'll pick up on something. <laughs> <laughs> but then I see that I'm all over the place. That I'm very ADD-ish. <laughs> <laughs> I will just explain some things if we have time. Sure. I just just want to say, Caddy, I think you had the best years. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, the 60s, yes. 70s, I, think I know. I went back many times. I went back many times. And, well, one time, oh, I'm another great part of my story, which I didn't tell you. And I got it. Uh, I interviewed a former living goddess, a Kumari. And that really was interesting because they don't like talking to foreigners. And then my daughter was working in Japan and she came. And I have a photograph of her with the, the form of Kumari. So if anybody wants to look at these things, I will do that. I just want to point one thing out too. Um, Cami is a hidden gem uh, for our next art show. <laughs> oh. What a wonderful that was a hard Could you thing. make that gesture one more time? <laughs> oh, oh, what was the gesture? I don't know. <laughs> that, that was Jamie. It was Jamie. Thank you. It's beautiful. Thank okay. You. It's absolutely wonderful. It's funny, I haven't seen it since because I, I did make a mess at one point. Oh, <laughs> we, we do a mess. Oh, you see, that's a copy of. Oh, no. It's on here. I, I just want to show you one other thing that I was wearing that I forgot to show you. Um, this brooch I got the last time I was in Kathmandu. And in the old photographs of Nepalese royalty and all sorts of people, often on the women's crowns, or, or maybe on the men's as well, there would be this sort of sun and moon. I just love it. So, um, Ganesha, you did stop me from having too many obstacles. Um, well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.